Okay, let's start everyone. So good afternoon everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to this uh, tutorial on understanding humor or dark humor with uh, internet memes analysis. I hope you're in the right tutorial. So um, when we first pitch about this tutorial to the web conference folks, they were like, hmm, non-LM, probably no high priority. But uh, I sort of told them that, yeah, this tutorial was meant to be a uh, safe ground for folks who are having LM fatigues. Okay, so if you are here, I'm going to assume that you probably have lesser interest in LMs, which is happening in many other tutorials, and therefore you're sitting here. Okay. So uh, with me today, I think uh, I have two other presenters, uh, Mingshan and uh, Ray. Uh, they, uh, so Ray is no longer a PhD student. She just officially graduated. She's now a postdoc uh, going to University of uh, Cambridge, right? So yeah. Uh, Tamoy, unfortunately, is not able to join us today uh, due to some family reasons. So today will be just three of us presenting. Okay? So I myself, I'm Roy, uh, assistant professor from SUTD. Okay? Three of us are from uh, local university. Okay, um, before I start about the content on this uh, tutorial, uh, this is just a standard warning label that we give for all the talks uh, that we have invited to give about memes. Okay, so uh, we hope that we don't offend anyone from this uh, uh, tutorial. Hope that you don't take offense on, on any of the examples that are being shown in here. Uh, yeah, so discussion is advice. okay? So maybe we start with the most basic question, right? What exactly is a meme? So uh, by definition, uh, from, from this particular source, okay, it says that it's amusing, interesting items, uh, such as a caption picture or video or genre of items that spread widely online, especially through social media. Okay, so anyone knows which is the first ever viral meme? Okay, so if you're here, I suspect that you probably is in this particular community. Okay, uh, the first one is actually this one, the Dancing Baby from 1995. Okay, so this was the first, if you search online, the first viral meme that went viral online. Uh, and of course, uh, the currently, the most popular meme template, if you go to image flip to find, uh, is the one by Drake. Okay, so uh, you can actually fit all sorts of things into it. Okay, so this is the one that I've just created. Okay, uh, which reflects the truth of our particular tutorial as well. Okay. Now, what actually makes a meme then? Let's break it down a little bit more on this. So memes, right, uh, is composed of funny uh, images and tags. Okay. Uh, and, and it offers you to discuss social or political messages uh, and you get passed around, okay, it spreads. And of course, uh, many of them are being used as a template uh, in communications. Okay, so this forms out the elements of what actually makes a memes, okay? So first of all, uh, it should be funny, it should be humorous, at least to some audience, okay? Some might take offense on it, but uh, there will be a small community, at least they'll find it humorous, okay? Um, more often than not, memes are multi-model. So it, it may consist of like images with video or an animated GIF or just a static image with like um, uh, image and the text overlay on it. Okay. Uh, and it usually con conveys a certain message or ideology. Okay. Sometimes uh, it may not, it, it might be just some random messages that's being spread on it. Uh, but more often than not, those that goes viral uh, typically contains certain message and ideology behind it. Later, we'll show some examples on this, okay? Uh, and for memes, typically it gets shared and it gets viral on this. And of course, as I mentioned, a good meme typically becomes a template. So like the one for trade, okay? So, um, you know, you, using a template, you're able to fit all sorts of messages into it and you can just share across online. So this is one uh, meme uh, that, that, that we can see uh, in here. Right, so it sort of like spreads a bit of like a humor. So, dude, racism is stupid. I'm black and white, uh, and Asian. Everybody loves me. Right, stop the hate and spread the love. So, this is a sort of a positive message meme. Uh, at the same time, it's trying to you know bring up the humor on this. Now, if you realize this particular meme, right, uh, it's multi-model. Why? It contains the text. It contains the the image itself. And if you just look at the image itself. Uh, you just know that it's a panda. If you look at the text itself, yeah, it stands alone, so it has a certain meaning in it. But it's only when you interpret together as a whole, as a holistic image, right, then you're able to understand what the message is trying to convey, okay? So that's typically an element that you see in a meme, typically, okay? So memes are being used in many of the social movement. So uh, they are very effective tools that actually to spread ideas and beliefs. Uh, one of the examples that uh, I can think of is this one. So this is an image of a rice, 
and a bunny. Okay, so to most of the folks who probably don't understand this, but for Chinese uh, users, okay, uh, you might be able to get that. Okay, so the, the Chinese word for rice is actually mi. Okay, and then the, the, the Chinese word for, for bunny is actually, uh, or rabbit is actually two. Okay, so he's trying to use this as a proxy to spread the idea of a Me Too movement. Okay, because this is actually censored in uh, Chinese social media. So Chinese social media, you are not able to spread this information. So what they do is that they actually use this term, Me Too, or spreading this public image, okay, uh, to basically bypass uh, the government censorship on this. Okay, so it's pretty viral uh, in China on this. And of course, on the other end, uh, you also have the Bernie Sanders uh, memes. Okay, so if you are recognizing this, this is a superimposed image. So this was not the original image on how Bernie Sanders looks like when you are sitting down uh, in, the, in this particular outfit. Uh, but it was superimposed in many of these memes. Okay, you will see many of these online, uh, many versions of this online. So they are being used in many settings. Uh, but end of the day, right, uh, what it boils down is that it helps to advocate some of his political beliefs in this. Okay, so um, it, the message... The message right, may not be that explicit to say that, okay, it's many care for all, change my mind. Uh, it can be just superimposed in many of these image and it spreads. But people will be asking that, oh, who is this particular old man that, that you know, that's spreading online uh, on, on all these kind of memes. And as they dig deeper, they'll get into the idea on, okay, what is the ideology or message that Bernie Sanders is actually sending? What's his political beliefs? So it helps to, to increase his popularity uh, during the, the, the elections on this as well. Okay, so these are some of the um, ways that the memes are being used. Uh, I did not put the more uh, explicit one. There are, of course, memes that are being spread during the war time. So, for example, right now, uh, the, the Israel-Hamas war and the um, uh, Russia-Ukraine war, you know, there have a lot of memes that are being spread from both parties, right? Uh, uh, trying to portray each other in, in negative likes. So these are memes that you can actually find online, quite a substantial number of them, actually. Okay, uh, and of course, uh, we also want to talk about memes with a darker twist, uh, which is also the center of today's team. So uh, one of the one of the type of memes that we deal with quite a fair bit, our research team, is to look at uh, hateful memes. Okay, so hateful memes are memes that basically targets a certain community or individual uh, by portraying them in a bad light, okay, or, or in a derogatory manner. Okay, so this is an example of a, a hateful memes that we got from uh, the Facebook memes challenge. Okay, so uh, how to get stone with no weeds. So this is, uh, if you interpret just the text itself, you probably don't get the message. If you look at the image itself, you also won't get an image. But if you interpret this as a whole, you'll know that actually it's trying to hint about uh, your homosexuality uh, in, in Muslim faith and uh, how you might get stoned uh, by this. Okay, so this is uh, how they actually portray um, hateful content on this. And of course, there's another side of the house, which is the uh, misinformation memes. So they try to spread misinformation using humor. So this is one example of it, okay? Um, particularly during the COVID days, uh, a lot of misinformation has been spread about vaccination, okay? So like you'll get memes spreading about um, vaccine, uh, uh, trying to mutate your genes or something like that, or even like this one, right? So for example, um, say there will be message going around saying that, um, vaccination is a way of uh, how government is actually tracking you. So they actually created this meme to say that, yeah, I'm just giving the vaccine. It doesn't mean that I'm tracking you. And then, uh, yeah, then they pull up this like a phone to say that, okay, I'm tracking you, but uh, but not because of the vaccine itself. Okay, so th there are a lot of these kind of memes that's trying to use humor to basically spread the, the message. So uh, sometimes you might find it funny, but at the same time, these are very subtle cue that you'll get, you know, psychologically, right? That you know that, okay, these messaging are being spread around the world on this, okay? So, and of course, what we really care about is this one, right? Can AI actually understand memes? So this is an example uh, that I have. Uh, you know, we asked the state of the art AI out there on how, so what you wanna make guess, like, you know, how much do they actually understand memes? Uh, technically, they can do it quite well. So I'm, I'm gonna show you some good examples on how they actually understand memes. So this is one. So in Canada, uh, they use special stickers to slow the car. Uh, in my country, we use the 3D techniques on this. So this is the meme that's being shared. So I asked ChatGPT, explain this meme to me. So this is what ChatGPT actually gave, right? ChatGPT says that this meme uh, humorously contrasts the safety measures between two countries in two different techniques. So it says for Canada, it's saying that, okay, it rightly captures to say that a meme is actually applying a sticker on the road. So he knows that this is actually a sticker, okay, that looks like a pothole. 
Okay, so in Canada, they use optical illusions to basically slow down cars. Then uh, on the part where it says about the booking fun part, right? So in my country, you use 3D techniques. In contrast, the meme suggests that the creator country, okay, uh, use have actually real potholes that serve as a natural way to slow down traffic. So you see, it is pretty good, right? In, in understanding humor, is under, understanding how um, this creator is actually throwing shade on his own country on things. Okay, so AI is actually doing quite well on this. Most of the means that you put to open AI, you put to chat GPT, is able to give you a pretty good explanation on things. Okay, now I'm going to show some negative example, okay, where actually open AI got it wrong or, or chat GPT got it wrong. Okay, let's look at this particular mean. See if you get the meaning on this. Okay, so you see if you get a different, you know, understanding from chat GPT. So I have these two. Um, so for folks who don't understand or, or do, don't know these two person, right? So it's Albert Einstein, okay, uh, and, and, uh, and Tagore, uh, Tagore, right? Yeah, so they, they are the two Nobel Prize winners. Okay, so do you understand this mean? You know why is this trying to keep? So if you look at what ChatGPT is explaining, okay, this is the expression. It suggests that there's a third unnamed person who doesn't have a Nobel Prize. You know, uh, both of the person are probably affirming they do. And the punchline is that the third person in the photo, uh, in the statement, technically true, uh, playfully misleading and all that. So it's actually trying to feel really. It's not able to get what's the meaning behind this. What is this meme trying to say? Exactly. The person who is reading it, we don't have the Nobel Prize, right? But GPT, Chat GPT is not able to understand that there's a third person and the third person refers to the reader. This is the part, it's not able to reason it out. So there is still a limitation in, in what Chat GPT can actually do on this. Okay, so there is a reasoning process and the reasoning process actually failed given this particular kind of memes. Okay. If you one more example on things. Okay, so this is something that I think I have to explain a little bit more to, to the international audience. This is a Singapore-based memes, okay? So um, the way ChatGPT interprets this is that, okay, uh, in here, okay, it put funds at the, uh, you know, predictability of government announcement and the official delivering them. It suggests that there is financial benefits to this coming in, okay? And, and expects a government official to soon make a public appearance to announce it to the public on this. That is not what this means is about, okay? If I give you some context to it, this particular person is the returning officer for elections. Okay, so this is the same person that will always announce the election results for Singapore. So what this means is trying to hint at is that, oh, government is giving us a lot of perks right now because elections is actually coming. So this is what this means is actually poking out on. Now, why did ChatGPT not understand this? Because number one, maybe ChatGPT is just recognizing this as a, as a person or assume that this person is just a server servant. It, it did not understand that there is a cultural context, there is a cultural background to it that is actually hinting about elections on this. Okay. So why is it challenging to understand memes? It's for these reasons. Number one, because it's multimodality. Okay, it's very hard to recognize the text and objects in the images. Hard in the sense that, you know, if it's just recognizing men, just recognizing an object is okay. But to know what's the cultural context of the object, which is the third point, right? It gets very hard. You know, to recognize the cultural backgrounds and of the objects in the memes, that gets very difficult. Now, then, of course, there's this part about complex reasoning, which, of course, AI is catching up, but there is some labs that is still missing, right? For example, it's not able to infer that, you know, uh, the, there is a third person and the third person is actually the reader himself, right? So it takes a bit of complex reasoning to basically get there, okay? And research has been done uh, in, in these aspects to, uh, to basically advance the cause of understanding memes uh, using AI. Okay, um, and that's what I've covered so far for the for the introduction part. I'm actually going to leave more time uh, for, for Ray and uh, Mingshan to cover more on the technical portion. So in the next part, um, Ray is going to take us through on the memes analysis tasks, such as memes classification, explanation and stuff. And of course, uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about the, the meme analysis model leveraging LMs. That's it, you know, I say that this is a uh, you know, resting ground for LM. We still cannot avoid it. We're still going to talk a little bit about it. And of course, uh, Ming Shan will be talking about the hands-on portion to introduce this new tool that we have built. It's called the MATK, uh, Meme Analysis Toolkit. So we'll give you really the tool on this. Uh, you can actually check this out. Uh, and of course, give us feedback on what other additional modules we can actually build to extend this particular tool on this. Okay. 
So, and of course, I'll come back later to basically talk a little bit about the gaps and opportunity in this space okay, that we invite uh, discussions uh, from, from the uh, audience on this. Okay, maybe I'll pass over my time to Ray on this. Okay, so thanks to the introduction from Roy uh, and I'm Rui and I'm a just graduated student from Singapore Management University and I will be joining Cambridge in June. So uh, actually uh, the atmosphere is quite relaxing. So please feel free to stop me if you have any question. Uh, so let me take over the second part, the meme analysis method. Uh, so actually the memes as introduced by Roy, the modern model memes are the images with the overlying short text on it. So uh, actually for all of the meme analysis uh, tasks, the first thing is that we need to understand the multimodal memes. So in other words, what is the meaning of the meme? Uh, so the very straightforward idea is that uh, although it is called the multimodal, can we understand the meme with only either its meme, me meme image or the meme text? So given this piece of meme, so can we understand it using its meme text only? So the meme text here is the Mississippi wind chime. The readers may get quite confused what the meme's actually about if you're re-owning the meme text. Alternatively, we may, uh, may, we may wonder if we can understand the meme with the meme image only. So the image here is showing three people handing over the trees. Clearly, you will still get quite confused and you cannot understand the actually, actual meaning of the meme by merely the meme image. So we may, we may come to the solution, right? So we may need to do the joint understanding or vision language understanding involving both the image and the text. So by this kind of joint comprehension, we know that the memes actually comparing the hand people to the wind chimes. But it seems that we, we are still one step before the actual meaning of the meme. Because uh, according to this interaction, we still do not know exactly what the meme is trying to convey. So uh, according, to, uh, according to the challenge, we may need some background knowledge about the meme. And in these cases, we may, have some, we may need to have some background knowledge about the related event to the image. So uh, do, do anyone know the, what kind of event is related to the image? I think most of the people, and uh, for me, even me, when I uh, see the image for the first time, I don't know what kind of event is associated with the image. So you can do some reverse image search by passing this piece of image to Google. And then with the searching engine, you know that the, actually the, uh, the image is related to the slaughter of black people in Mississippi back to uh, many years ago. And by this kind of joint comprehension of both the visual language information and the external background knowledge about image, finally you reach the actual meaning of the meme. So actually the vision language side, uh, in other words, the meme side is showing the people is, the, is showing that the meme is comparing the hand people to the wind chime. And according to the background knowledge from the image side, we know that the hand people in the image were died because of the slaughter of black people in Mississippi. So by joint reasoning or complex reasoning uh, between the uh, meme information and the external knowledge, we reach the finally, uh, finally mean, we finally reach the meaning of the meme. So the meme is actually making joke of the slaughter of the black people by comparing them to the wind chimes. Therefore, the meme is quite helpful towards black people. So that's to see there are several major challenges in the meme understanding. So firstly, uh, you should not only have the uh, understanding of individual modalities about the meme image and the meme text, but also you have to conduct the joint vision language understanding. In other words, to, do, to understand the interactions between the meme image and the meme text. So here you need to uh, refer the wind chime in the meme text to the hand people in the meme image. And secondly, in some cases, it requires the external knowledge beyond the meme. Uh, for instance, like the cultural background knowledge and the, some kind of common sense. So in this example, you need to understand the event associated with the image. So, and in this example, the image is related to the slaughter of black people. And thirdly, the two kinds of information is not enough. You have to conduct uh, the third step of complex reasoning, like the reasoning across modalities, the reasoning with the incorporation of external knowledge. Uh, for instance, with the complex reasoning, you finally understand the meme is making joke of the slaughter of black people so that it is hateful. So uh, 
as we previously mentioned, there are several challenges. So people came up with different solutions. So initially, people would like to think, oh, there are different challenges. So we can design different architectures for different challenges. For instance, in order to lay the model to understand the vision and language on interactions, we can use more sophistic sophisticated multimodal fusion mechanisms. And uh, normally people uh, initially train the models from scratch with the task specific data. But obviously uh, there's a problem with this kind of initial solutions uh, because uh, the meme related task always has, are always associated with the scarcity of the data. So here I show three commonly used benchmarks for HIPAA meme detection. So compared with the other tasks, you can see the training data is quite limited. So according to the table, you see that for all three datasets, the training data is actually less than 10K. Uh, that's because annotating meme-related data is quite expensive and quite laborious, and it's also very subjective. And you should have some um, person with certain kind of background knowledge. So uh, that's why the uh, mean data is always limited. And the impact from this kind of scarcity of the data is that the model trained with this kind of limited data can be easily overfitting to the training data so that they are incapable to generalize to other data sets or other domains. And not as so uh, also with the prevalence of the light language model. So currently using portrait models is a very uh, popular choice. So the portrait models are trained with large amount of data from different sources, and they are trained mostly with the unsupervised ob objectives. And the models portrayed with this kind of diagrams can learn universal representations, and they are quite good at generalization. So in the next, uh, in the following sessions, I will uh, talk more about how we can use portrait models for meme analysis. But for instance, the portrait vision language model, the large uh, language models for meme analysis. And uh, to give, uh, to, to do some warm up, I will first give a brief introduction to the uh, portrait models. And then I will um, elaborate how we can utilize portrait models to the meme analysis tasks. And I categorize the way we use portrait models uh, based on whether we use fine-tuned portrait models or frozen portrait models, whether we use a single portrait model or a composition, in other words, multiple portrait models. And uh, I will use the task of heat for meme detection as a test bed to show how we can uh, utilize the categories of uh, using portrait models for meme analysis tasks. And in the second part, which is after the coffee break, I will introduce more uh, meme analysis tasks, which are beyond the classification task. For instance, like the interpretation of the meme, which is a generation task, and also uh, the counter hippo meme generation, which is trying to correct or, uh, or moderate the hippo memes. So let's firstly come to a brief introduction of the portrait models. Uh, I guess most of you will be quite familiar with the portrait model, so I will go through this part quickly. So initially people started with uh, portraying language model for natural language processing. And they portray the language models with trillions of texture documents and with mostly the unsupervised uh, portraying, for instance, like the masked language prediction, uh, which is trying to predict a masked word according to the uh, surrounding words, uh, sur surrounding words or its context, and also the next word prediction. And the portrait language models are mostly based on the transformer architectures. And according to the, their architecture types, they can be categorized into the encoder, decoder, encoder only, and the decoder only. And uh, this figure on the right-hand side shows uh, the architectures of the recent portrait models according to, the four, uh, according to the three categorizations of the portrait language model architectures. So the encoder owning Portraying language models can encode the text and generate very ex expressive textual representation. However, they cannot generate the text directly. They can be uh, used for uh, used as encoders and generate some expressive representations of the input text. And the other one, maybe most of you will be very familiar with, the, is the decoder owning architecture. And the recent very popular ChatGPT or GPT-4 all adopt this uh, series of uh, architectures. And these kind of uh, decoder owning language models are quite strong at text generation. And also there is the third kind, which is called the encoder decoder uh, protein language model. And they are powerful at natural language understanding tasks. 
And uh, recently, people find if we uh, conduct further fine tuning of the pre language model on the collection of data set described via instructions, which is called the instruction tuning, the models can be further improved, uh, can be further enhanced to, gen to, get better gen to get better generalization to unseen tasks. And along with the pre uh, language model, there is also the pre vision language model for vision language understanding. And similarly, there are uh, also trained with uh, supervised pre-training. But here, uh, the pre-training ob objectives may be a bit different because it should cater for the multi-model understanding aspects. For instance, the math vision language understanding. Uh, in order to predict the mask word, uh, you should not only have the information from the, uh, the context of the word, but also you have to use the information from the input image. And similarly, they have the encoder-decoder architecture, the encoder-only architecture, and the decoder-only architectures. And uh, nowadays, people can also say pre-trained vision language model adopt the vision language instruction tuning. For instance, you can, uh, if you're, I wonder if you're familiar with the instruction bleep, lava, and mplug, they are also uh, adopting this kind of visual instruction tuning method. Uh, after the brief introduction to the portrait models, let's come to the second part, how we can use the portrait models for meme analysis tasks. Uh, actually, I categorized the method based on whether we use fine-tuned or frozen portrait models and whether we use a single portrait model or a composition of the portrait models. So initially, people, uh, because of the model, it's not so large, so people can fine-tune the model and use the model as some kind of feature extractor. So good tuning performance can be achieved by uh, tuning the model with the downstream task data. Uh, so uh, here I will uh, use the pre vision language model as an example. So the pre vision language model can generate very expressive vision language uh, representation if you, input, uh, in, if, if you input a piece of text and an image. For instance, like the visual bird, visual bird, XMR, uh, uh, et cetera. And with the scaling of the model sizes, the direct application of the portrait models in a zero manner can already achieve quite good performance. Uh, and it requires uh, no additional adaptation. For instance, currently the flip two, the lava and plug can all achieve quite good zero shot performance on several vision language understanding tasks. Okay, so. Uh, initially, people would prefer using a single model, but in some cases, as we know, the task itself is very complex. So a single model does not acquire all of the reasoning skills needed for the task. For instance, let's uh, use hippo meme detection as, a, as an example. So in order to understand a meme, you need to understand the visual metaphors. And in order to detect the hippo content, you need to understand the definition of the hate speech. And also, uh, you have to uh, have to acquire the skill of decoding the underlying meaning of the hateful memes. So in that case, a single portrait model may not be enough, so that people alternatively use a composition of the portrait models for this kind of complex task. So that's to say by combination, we will have four blocks. That's, that's uh, tuning a single model, using a single frozen model, a composition of the two model, and a composition of frozen models. Um, so here I categorize the meme related task according to the uh, type of outputs. Um, so basically we will have two types of the meme related task here. So the first one is the classification task and the second one is the generation task. So for classification task, there may be some detection related task like detecting the hateful meme, the harmful meme, the offensive memes. And also in some cases, uh, they asked for uh, predicting the targets of some memes, in, for instance, predicting the targets of the hateful memes. And regarding to the generation task, uh, firstly, we, we can think of, a, think of a meme analysis task like the meme comprehension. And also we, we have the task of uh, meme interpretation, like uh, decoding the underlying meaning of the sarcastic or hateful memes uh, to elaborate why the meme is sarcastic or hateful. And secondly, uh, and thirdly, we also have a generation task, which is to generate uh, the counter hateful meme to correct the hateful meme. But uh, as you can see here, we have a lot of uh, tasks related to meme analysis. Here, I will only pick the hateful meme detection as a test bed to show how my previous categorization of using pressure models can be applied to the meme analysis tasks. 
Uh, please note, all, all the methods are generalizable to uh, meme and other meme analysis tasks as well as other visual language understanding tasks. Okay, so uh, let's come to the first part. What is the task of HIFO meme detection? I guess some of you may be already very familiar with the HISP detection. And the HIFO meme detection is somewhat the extension to the vision language modality side. So that's given a meme, the model needs to predict whether it is HIFO or not HIFO. So what is HIFO? The hifo means means uh, the meme is actually attacking or using discriminatory content targeting a person or a group based on their race, gender, etc. And clearly, uh, this classification task is a binary classification, right? So you, you should classify whether it is HIFO or not HIFO. And, uh, and it can also be regarded as a vision language classification task. So a very naive or straightforward solution is that we can directly fine tune the pre-trained vision language model with the downstream HIFO meme detection data. Because the pre-trained vision language model are quite good at bridging the vision language gap. So uh, this is the very straightforward and is also very is is also the initial solutions that researchers have applied to the uh, research field of HIFO meme detection, uh, and it can takes uh, take the place in the first block of the categorization. But clearly, there's some limitations about the direct fine tuning of the pre-trained uh, models. So uh, generally, they will regard the HIFO meme detection as a very uh, general vision language classification task, and they ignore the task specific characteristics. For instance, if you have some uh, background about the history, you, you understand that uh, extracting or understanding the victims of the targets of the history is quite important for the HIPAA content detection. And secondly, the meme text and the meme image are uh, weakly aligned compared with the uh, pre-training data of the pre-trained vision language model. So for instance, here, as you can see, the actually the meme is hateful towards black people, right? But there is no explicit mention of black people in the text. So it makes it harder for the pre-trained vision language model to understand uh, what is the actual victim or targets of the hateful meme, which may finally hurt the hateful uh, meme detection performance of the models. So the solution is that uh, with, without directly tune the model, Maybe we can incorporate some uh, task-specific task components, which caters for the unique characteristics of different tasks. And then we incorporate the component with the portrait models and connect the end-to-end -end tuning. So, uh, so it also takes the place of the first block. And it comes to our uh, one of the paper from our group, uh, which is called the Dismalty Hate. So uh, the goal of this paper is to uh, disentangle the representation of hate speech related target entities. So in other words, it is designed to cater for the uh, goal of extracting or understanding the targets of the hateful memes. So how can the, how can the model uh, do it? So firstly, we will augment the image target entities to the meme text. So for instance, giving this piece of meme, we will use some external tools or portrait models to extract the uh, entities from the image. For instance, the image is related to the black people, black people slaughtered in Mississippi, the black people lynched. And then we will augment the entities to the meme text so that you can see there is explicit mention of the targets in the uh, targets in the text so that the text and the image are more aligned. And be, beside that, we add a task-specific component, which is called the target latent space, which forces the, uh, the model to generate joint representation for the meme image and the meme text, uh, which can disentangle the target entities. But because of the time, uh, I just omit the details here. So if you're interested, you can uh, search on the web for our paper. We publish both the code and the paper online. Uh, so the by, by this kind of uh, task-specific component, finally, we can generate a target-aware representation for the meme image in the meme text. And by using this framework, we achieve 10% absolute performance over the direct fine tuning of the visual birds. And similarly, there is another piece of paper, which is called the TOT, Topology of Wear Optimal Transport. Uh, and this paper also consider incorporating task-specific component to make the uh, meme image and the meme text more aligned. 
So the high level idea is that it will formulate the cross model al alignment problem as solutions for optimal transportation plans. So firstly, you can see there are uh, three main components here. Uh, in other words, three stages. So in the first stage, they will uh, they will design a pairwise course to uh, align the elements in the image and the text. And in the second step, they will try to minimize the uh, cost so that uh, you, you, you can get the sense that actually they minimize the cost um, and then the uh, alignment will be enhanced. And finally, they will, um, based on the minimal cost, they will generate more aligned representation. And this kind of more aligned representation will be finally used for the hateful meme detection. So uh, regarding to the first block of the categorization, we have two strategies. The first one is that we can do the direct fine tuning. And the second one is that we can uh, fine tune the model by incorporating some task-specific task components, which are designed to cater for the unique characteristics of different tasks. And as I mentioned previously, uh, the meme understanding requires the background knowledge. For instance, in here, in order to understand the meme, you need to have the common sense, uh, what is the smell of the roses? Maybe most of us will have, but in some cases, the background knowledge, maybe uh, people from different countries may not have that kind of background knowledge. And so does the model. So um, actually, so currently the Persian language models have been trained with trillions of uh, textual documents. So actually they can be uh, regarded as implicit knowledge bases. In other words, there is implicit knowledge embedded in the Persian language models. So we propose a method to try to leverage the implicit knowledge in the Persian language models. However, there is a problem that the meme image are not comprehensible to the Persian language models. So alternatively, to solve the problem, we use a frozen Pertrain vision language model for converting image to its textual descriptions. So that's come to our prompt hate paper, which was published in the EMLP 2023. So basically the high level idea is that we convert the hateful meme classification task into a mask language modeling task. That's because the Pertrain language model we use are trained with the mask language modeling task. So by the conversion, the task will be converted to the objective more similar to its pre-training objective. So that it further, uh, in, further uh, helps uh, if we want to use the implicit knowledge uh, stored in the pre-training language model. But that's not enough because we would like to uh, give more contextual information to the model. So we further add two demonstrations beside the testing instance. And then based on the two demonstrations in the testing instance, we next prompt the Pertrain language model to leverage the implicit knowledge in stored in the Pertrain language models. So uh, actually the prompt hit model can be uh, regarded as the intersection of tuning a single model and using a frozen single model. So it uses a very specific tuning method, which is called prompting the language model. And also it makes use of frozen uh, a single frozen Pertrain vision language model to converting the image to textual descriptions, which are comprehensible by the Pertrain language models. But we will wonder why, why we always need tuning, right? Why, why cannot we directly use frozen Pertrain models? And also considering the very strong performance, zero shot performance, uh, of several multi-model models on the vision language tasks. So on the left-hand side, you can see the VQA performance back to 2018, and they are all fully supervised models. But on the, uh, on the, uh, sorry, on the right-hand side, you can see the zero-shot VQA performance in 2023 with the Bleep2 model. So by comparing the two, you can see nowadays the zero-shot performance can already uh, be comparable or even surpass the previously fully supervised result. So why can we directly apply this kind of strong Pertrain vision language model to the hateful meme detection task, uh, which is also a vision language task? That's because uh, that's a very sad story because if you directly apply the uh, Pertrain vision language model for a hateful meme detection, it achieves only near random gaze. So the accuracy is near uh, 50%, whereas the AUC-ROC is less than 60%. 
So um, on the other hand, uh, if we do not uh, use the frozen pre-trained models, right, we need to uh, use the tuning method over the pre-trained models. But currently, uh, you can see an increasing size of the models so that it is very expensive for tuning this kind of uh, models. So we may still want to favor the frozen uh, pre-trained models. So we come to the solution that instead of applying the frozen pre-trained model over the whole task, in other words, over the uh, over the hypomine uh, task itself, maybe we can leverage the power of the frozen pre-trained model to facilitate a substate in hypomine detection. So let's recall the prompt hit prompt hit model architecture. So in the prompt hit, uh, in order to make the image comprehensible by the pre-trained language model, we use a frozen vision language model to do the image to text conversion, right? So actually the subset here is the image content understanding to the language model. So following the, uh, following the idea, we would still like to use the pre-trained vision language model to facilitate this step. But there's also some limitation with the image to text conversion, because obviously there will be some loss of information. And uh, by using the pre-trained vision language model to describe the image, you just give some very generic image description, like there is a dog, the, the, there is a sun in the sky, this kind of thing. But generic image captions may omit crucial details, such as the race, the gender of the people, et cetera. Whereas this kind of demographic information is quite important to the hypomeme detection task. Additionally, uh, alternatively, you can always rely on the uh, external uh, or additional image tags from something like Google Vision. And uh, so you can see the table. Uh, when, you, uh, when you train the model without the additional image tag, the performance is quite lower than uh, the one on the bottom side. So, uh, so you can see the gap between using and not using the additional image tags. But uh, by extracting the image tags, it is quite expensive and it is also payable. So we wonder whether we can leverage or fully harness the power of the pre-trained vision language model to facilitate, to really facilitate a substep in hypomeme detection. In other words, how we can better utilize the power of the pre-trained vision language model uh, in a frozen manner, but still to facilitate the hypomeme detection task. So that comes to our ProCap paper, which was published in SMMM 2023. So, the ultimate goal here is that we would like to <clears throat> do some probing-based captioning with the frozen pre-trained vision language model so that we generate some hateful content-related captions, uh, uh, which is different from the uh, generic uh, image captions. So uh, to achieve the goal, firstly, we design a set of probing questions. And these questions are specifically designed to cater for common vulnerable targets in the hateful contents, like uh, what is the race of the people in the image? Uh, what is the religion of the people in the image? For instance, actually the generic image, uh, generic image description will not cover the religion of the people in the image. However, by our problem-based captioning, it will cover the uh, demographic information of the uh, people in the image and the religion of the people in the image, et cetera. And then based on this probing question, we prompt the frozen pre-trained vision language model so that we have a, we can obtain a set of hateful content related captions. And then we uh, incorporate this kind of hateful content related captions to some text-based uh, hateful, hateful meme detection models like our previous prompt hate model, right? So by using the this kind of probing-based captioning with, with abbreviation as the ProCap, we can see the prompt head model with ProCap surpass, surpasses the basic prompt head significantly. And also, as you can see, the last uh, row, the prompt head with the ProCap even achieved comparable performance to the prompt head model with additional image tags. But please note the additional image ta tags are payable. So uh, similarly, there is there are also some other works which are trying to use the pre-trained language model. Uh, for instance, nowadays people are trying to use the frozen uh, are trying to use the reasoning capabilities inside the pre-trained language model. For instance, they can use the pre-trained language model to generate the rationales of the hateful meme detection in order to explain why the memes are hateful. 
And then they try to distill this kind of rationale from the frozen large language model, in other words, the ChatGPT to smaller models, and incorporate this kind of generated rationales to the hip mean detection. Uh, so uh, that's to see by using a single frozen model, maybe the direct, maybe directly apply the frozen pre-trained model is not feasible to some complex task like hip mean detection but we can always facilitate a sub-step with the power of a single frozen pre model. Uh, so uh, I wonder if you have any question, please feel free to uh, ask. Okay, uh, sorry, I just asked, it's not over. <laughs> okay. okay, so uh, okay. I, will, I will not try to break you before the break. Okay, uh, so, so thirdly, uh, the the uh, thirdly, as we know that the memes may be tied to evolving events, right? So as you can see, there are a lot of people memes uh, related to different events like COVID nineteen, the U.S. presidential election, and the war of Ukraine, right? Uh, so actually, this dynamic nature of the memes make it very hard to train a model, right? Uh, because you cannot get uh, enough training instances for memes associated with e each event. However, all of the previous methods we are talking about are fully supervised. And there is no existing work considering the hip meme detection in the low resource setting. Whereas according to the dynamic nature of the memes, this kind of low resource setting, the exploration in the low resource setting is quite important. And if we consider directly apply the pre vision language model in a zero short manner for the hip meme detection, as I previously said, they achieve near random gaze performance. And even in a few shot manner, it also achieves near random gaze performance. So uh, in this piece of work, we got the inspiration from triathlon. So uh, triathlon is a big complicated task, right? So the athletes may compete for three separate uh, sports, the swimming, the cycling, and the running. So normally they will not be trained jointly for the three tasks. So initially they will train with separate sports, like they will be trained to swim, be trained to do cycling, be trained to do the running. So after they acquire uh, the different the, the skills for different sports to some extent, then they learn to compose the uh, these separate skills for the triathlon. So we got the inspiration uh, from triathlon and think of maybe we can leverage the power of the composition of the pre models. And uh, these kind of pre models are already uh, are already capable of an essential skills in advance. So the very difficult uh, hip meme detection task will be converted to a relatively easier task, which is to learn a composer. And the composer is to compose this kind of acquired reasoning skills in advance for hip meme detection. So uh, basically, we may wonder what kind of essential reasoning skills are needed for hip mean detection. So in this piece of work, we identify three levels of reasoning skills for hip mean detection, but uh, that's not enough. But for this piece of work, we just uh, keep it there and maybe more uh, reasoning skills should be, uh, or should be considered uh, further. So uh, the first level of the reasoning skills is that the model needs to understand the definition of the hate speech. In other words, it can uh, distinguish between the hippo content and the non-hippo content. So if you pass a piece of hate speech uh, to the model, the, expe the expected output from the model is that it should say, oh, this piece of text is hippo. And the second level of the reasoning skill is that the model can elaborate the meme message, maybe by understanding the visual metaphors and by understanding the multi-model interactions. So for instance, giving this uh, meme image Giving this uh, multimodal meme, the expected output for elaboration of meme message is that the meme is comparing hand people to wind chimes. And the third level of the reasoning skills is that the model can decode the underlying meaning uh, to the hippo memes, maybe by complex reasoning or by the incorporation of the background knowledge. So this meme, uh, by this kind of de um, decoding the meaning, so the meme is actually making joke of the slaughter of black people by comparing the hat people to wind chimes. Therefore, the meme is hateful. So that comes to finally, after identifying the three levels of reasoning skills, that comes to our module right network for a few shot hateful meme detection, uh, which was accepted uh, in triple W. And if you're interested in the 
More details of our paper, we will also uh, have our paper presented in the poster session on Wednesday. So uh, if you're interested in the details, please feel free to join us in the poster session. Uh, but here, here I will only provide some high level idea. So the high level idea is that uh, firstly, we will acquire essential reasoning skills for hip mean detection. And in the second stage, we will learn a composer to compose these reasoning skills within the field shot example. And thirdly, based on the composer and the essential reasoning skills, then we construct the modularized network for hip mean detection. And um, actually, you can see that there is a place which is left blank. So this, this is called the composition of the frozen protein model. Uh, so we can imagine some very complex task, but the task itself is decomposable. So in other words, we know that the first step, we need to do something. And in the second step, we need to do something. And the execution can be in a symbolic manner. So in, in, by decomposing a complete, complex task in this manner, we can assign the subject, subtasks to proper pre-trained models without requiring any tuning. For instance, like the task of visual question answering, we can always assign the object detection task to some uh, object detectors. We can always assign the, some uh, relational reasoning task to some uh, reference localization models. However, this is or this this block is just black uh, regarding to the research field of hateful mean detection. So maybe we would uh, in the future we will have some work regarding to uh, these categories category of using portrait model and to make the model really uh, interpretable. Uh, so that's all for my current part. Okay, do you have any question? Thanks to your question. So actually, uh, because in order to make it more uh, straightforward to the readers during the presentation, we use one, actually, uh, it may be a bit uh, disturbing to some readers, but we use a one uh, which is quite helpful so that it is more straightforward to the audience. Yeah, your, your sense is quite uh, correct because during the during our investigation to the, during our investigation of the hippo meme related data sets, we also find uh, some of the memes are quite hateful, and some of the memes are not so hateful. And uh, actually, this is an open question because annotating the dataset itself is quite subjective. So actually, they will uh, require some linguistics for annotating the datasets. So uh, I think they have a very um, some some rules. Like you can also also find the definition of hate speech on the Facebook. So they have some rules to define what is hateful and what is not hateful. And uh, in some cases, uh, the hatefulness may not be so straightforward. In, in other words, the hatefulness is implicit or embedded in the hateful memes. But I, to, in my opinion, I think this kind of hateful memes is also very harmful towards the society, right? Because it can uh, escape from some detection models easily. And especially when I was doing some case study about the models, I find out this kind of implicit hateful memes are quite challenging for the model to detect it. So I think, although uh, obviously or straightforwardly, it is, it, it is not so, it, it does not seem so hateful, but the uh, the uh, it may potentially result in some uh, discord among communities. Yeah, so I think we should still pay a lot of attention or especially pay a lot of attention to this kind of implicit hippo memes. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, even if it's only detecting the most painful mm -hmm. uh, memes that are out there, it's still mm -hmm. to be able to provide that function. It's going to be so fairly mm -hmm. and approach to discovering that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm part of the sustainability, and then quite a low heat. It's no contact. So they are not quite that extreme. So the point of like trigger the threshold for the air models to see that thing. But at the same time, there is some implicit heat that exists on it, and therefore escape the model, and therefore it goes to a wild place, right? So these are the one that, that is a little bit problematic, a bit more debated. So, so we had a lot of chats with uh, the different social media platforms because we work with them quite a bit. So one of the things that they also raised to us is that, look, they are social media companies and it is not in the social media company's interest to always remove content. So in as much as possible, they will try not to remove content unless it's absolutely necessary. And therefore the practice is quite a right? Because if it's absolutely you know, it's faithful, it's absolutely hateful, feel will take it down. But those that are, you know, debatable and, and, and it's subjective and all, they might let it sleep, they might let it pass because it is not in the interest of all these platform companies to basically remove content. So, so that's that's always a, a problem that we face. Uh, with that. So that's one. The other thing is, uh, which is super interesting, which I think that you saw the same impression too, um, is also about the subjectivity in terms of hateful towards who. Right. So, for example, right, um, there are certain contents that, you know, uh, person A of a certain demographic background, like things like that is okay. But person B, I like, felt that, no, no, this is really, really authentic. It might be my cultural content. Right. So, how do we know that, you know, it is for who? We have a recent work on this. Uh, we submitted to, to, to the main shop this. What we did was we get, let's say, uh, a state of the art AI, or let's say it's ChatGPT. We get ChatGPT to simulate certain profile. Suppose I say that, I say, um, it's the same way. So let's say, given a mean, in the past, we said, given this mean, do you think this is it or not? This time round, we say that, assuming that you are a white male, blah, 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 given this mean, do you think this is it or not? Turns out that substituting a different profile, uh, persona, the output is substantially different. Uh, and, and that becomes a little bit problematic. Actually, it raises up to, to, to them on this. There is no clear solution to that. But what we did found is that this is a problem that there exists. Even with very clear guidelines on hateful content policy, we might not be able to regulate everything in this state. Yeah, yeah. There's going to be some low hanging fruit that really obvious to me. Yes. Uh, when some never have a code. So that's a, I think that's just a code in the right direction. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, maybe this is asking and demanding. Much more uh, harder task for already of a harder task that like the means and the world is always evolving and the event, there is always recent events and means about recent events, right? And we all know that PLMs and PLVMs and PBLMs suffer from knowledge problems. So, like, are there like and uh, some successful attempts or like uh, good direction forward to like acknowledge the recent events. I think it's a quite interesting question, and it's point out a very promising direction regarding the HIPAA meme detection or other meme analysis task. So you mentioned the dynamic nature of the memes. Yeah, that's true. So we can uh, see the memes uh, associated with evolving events. And in order to uh, detect the this kind of meme, so I can think of two solutions. The first one is uh, capture the invariant natures of the uh, meme detection, like understanding what is he for and uh, uh, trying to do the meme comprehension. So this kind of invariant uh, nature you should require with some uh, skill learning of the model, like what I present, like we identify three essential reasoning skills. And this is the first step I can think of. And the second step, step is that we may, uh, the model itself is not enough. So we may need to do some retrieval from the web, right? So uh, actually we are currently doing this kind of retrieval uh, uh, regarding to the image side. So previously I mentioned that we do some image uh, entity augmentation right, in the first piece of work. So this is the, conducted by the reverse image search. So we uh, generally you can think of that you input the meme image into the uh, Google search engine and you get a lot of related events to the uh, meme image. So that is one kind of 
retrieval augmented, but it's purely to the uh, meme image part. But clear, clearly, we 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 could or we should do the same for the text part as well as the interaction of the meme image and the meme text part. I think you point out a very um, interesting direction, and I, I think we would like to try it in the future. Besides so of having uh, hateful speech, uh, I think memes are also supposed to be funny. Yeah. And do you have some approaches for related to funnies? <laughs> actually, <laughs> actually, personally, although I'm working on the hip hop meme detection, I prefer enjoying the uh, very humorous memes myself. Uh, but currently, I work more on the aspect of the hip hop meme, but but uh, our lab work more uh, or work as well to some maybe a sarcastic meme or the funny memes, so maybe we can elaborate a bit. So, so actually, that's a, that's a very trust. It's like um, we, we did have a work uh, very recently thing by, by, by uh, looking at creating a new beam generator. So how do you automatically create new, uh, not using uh, before even the uh, DVD 4 b comes about. So we did that. Uh, one of the problem that I think we face after the generation uh, as for what I'm asking is that how do we know whether the meme is humorous or not? So we're like, yeah, I mean, as for what all ML projects, we have a classifier to do this. Uh, unfortunately, this time around, we don't have the classifier. <laughs> so what we did was we did a lot of human experiments. Uh, we get people to wait, you know, whether the created needs is humorous enough and all. Uh, we had a recent work on this that was out last year. And it turns out that uh, using the, the human, I mean, the, the human generated meme type is still rated much more humorous than the AI generated one. So even if you try, uh, even today, if you try using the uh, ChatGPT to generate, right, it doesn't generate uh, very good of a meme, right? So unfortunately, uh, humor, uh, at least uh, for, for memes kind of humor, uh, humans still perform better than AI within this aspect for now. So uh, yeah, and unfortunately, we don't have a way to basically automatically read the, the humor of a particular title. But if we have that, uh, of course, then we'll be able to generate very good news. But I think because of the absence of a classification model to classify humor that well, therefore the generated part of it will not be that good. So that's the current state of the art and that we are at that time. And, and that's a very interesting point, actually. So um, we are aware of works that are looking at text based humor. So uh, they are looking at you know uh, breaking down humor into very dry forms, basically understand the linguistic cues on what makes what makes a particular sentence humorous. So there have been work that that uh, that studies that, but even with the kind of like template based kind of study, they don't generate uh humorous sentence that well. So I think generating the multimodal humorous memes will be even a harder task going forward. That's a very interesting research that I'm aware that uh, at least in my Twitter friends, I, I'm aware that there's some uh, PhD students who's looking at this. Uh, but how successful it is, I think that will really take a four years to be to get this to carry out. Kind of a very right different teaching AI to this kind of understand what they not hate for and what they hate for, but uh, we think how to so now think that uh, hate for is the very subjective so how do you uh, make the model to distinguish something so in other words how to make the model more intuitive how to bring the model one. Okay, so so uh, I guess your question is about this one, right? This one, right? So, so actually we focus on the uh, few shot headphone meme detection. So we make sure uh, when we require these essential reasoning skills, actually we, we're using auxiliary data rather than headphone meme data. So how we let the model acquire this capability is through training the model on the hate speech, pure text-based hate speech data. And this kind of, Pure text-based history data are annotated from some linguistics, and we try to aggregate uh, history data from different uh, diff different datasets. 
to cover because some of them may cover uh, res resist, some of them will cover the uh, system. So we will make sure we gather uh, as much as possible of the hate speech data so that we train a better hate speech detection module so that it can distinguish between the hateful and non hateful content. So that's how we, uh, how we do it. But uh, what you mentioned is that maybe, I guess your question is maybe there are some bias or subjectivity inside the annotator themselves, right? Um, for that one, I think uh, because these data sets are uh, well-established data sets and they're uh, widely used data sets, I think, uh, yeah, I look through some of the uh, examples, maybe uh, some of the examples may, uh, may be a bit controversial, but I think uh, most of them are quite good quality. Oh, good quality. Okay, so uh, currently I'll come to the I'll come to the second part of the uh, tutorial, which is about the uh, some tasks beyond the classification. So firstly, I will talk about the interpretation of the memes, which is a generalization generation task, and then I will talk about the counter hippo meme, which is a relatively new task. Uh, the goal here is to correct the hippo meme by generating uh, the moderation version of the hippo memes. So firstly, let's come to the interpretation of the hippo meme. The goal here is to decode the underlying meaning of the hippo memes, in other words, to interpret why the meme is hippo. So to conduct this kind of task, you need to do complex reasoning and maybe by incorporating potential background knowledge involved. So for instance, given this piece of hippo meme, the model needs to uh, interpret that the meme is making joke about the slaughter of black people by comparing the hand black people to wind chimes. Therefore, the meme is hateful towards black people. And currently, as we previously mentioned, the interpretation of the hippo meme involves uh, the complex reasoning as well as the background knowledge. So currently, most of people will harness the power of the Persian language model, in other words, the light language model for this kind of interpretation generation task. So uh, they harness the reasoning capability and the knowledge embedded in the large language model. For instance, this piece of work uh, just convert all the information into its textual description and feed that one to the frozen large language model for the rational generation. And on the other hand, there's also the other task, which is called the counter hippo meme generation. Uh, because the given a hippo meme, we would not uh, want it to be so hippo, so we would like to moderate the hipponess of the meme. So the goal of this meme analysis task is to convert a hippo meme to be a non-hippo non conversion. But uh, regarding to this research field, only one piece of work is about converting or moderating the hippo memes. And they propose a relatively naive approach by replacing the meme text only. So they conduct this one with the help of the large language model. So they will prompt the large language model to generate a new piece of text, which, uh, which com when combined with the uh, meme image, so that the whole uh, meme will not be hateful any longer. So clearly you can see there's a lot of research fields uh, that are under investigated. For instance, in the uh, regarding to the interpretation of the memes. Uh, so currently people only consider about the post hoc explanations like generating the rationales of the models or uh, interpreting how the model make the prediction by attending to the different regions of the image or attending to different words by assigning different attention weights. But maybe uh, we can also design some ad hoc explainable models to be to make the uh, prediction, to make the meme analysis models more transparent. But this area has not been explored yet. And the second research field that is underdeveloped is about the devising of the detection models. So according to the observation in the pure text-based hate speech models, we find out the models may be quite biased towards uh, certain groups, uh, certain target entities uh, appeared in the hate speech text. For instance, if you mention black people uh, in a piece of hate speech, in a, in a piece of text, the model is likely to predict, oh, they mention, hate, uh, they mention black people, oh, this piece of uh, text is hate speech. And the sim and similar phenomena is also appearing in the hateful meme detection task. 
So the model may be biased towards certain group of the, uh, in the image. For instance, if there appear some Muslims in the image, the models are more likely to predict the meme as hateful memes. And thirdly, as we previously said, correcting the hateful meme is very important because uh, it, it just gives some trade up between the freedom and the restrictions of the hate, hate speech. So uh, we may want to moderate the hateful memes without changing its uh, its uh, ultimate, its uh, actual meaning. But currently only one piece of work, which I have just introduced previously, uh, tries to correct the hateful memes. And it, it is proposing some relatively uh, easier approach by replacing the meme text only. And this one uh, will totally convert or change the desired meaning of the meme so that uh, this kind of correction may still uh, need a lot of uh, efforts for improvements. So uh, that's to say, in conclusion, more in-depth research is needed for the meme analysis uh, research field. So let me hand over to my partner, uh, Mingshan, for the hand down with the uh, MATK uh, implementation. Okay, so thank you, Ray, for the comprehensive uh, talk on you know the recent advancement mm -hmm. on uh, the different kind of approaches for uh, meme detection and meme analysis, right? So in this part, we will talk about, you know, what are the uh, practical steps or important uh, data pipeline to perform when dealing with uh, memes. So first of all, uh, for the content of this like uh, hands-on session, there will be uh, in total about, we can summarize it into like four segments, right? So first of all, there's a data pre-processing, pre pre where we'll go through like the different kind of approaches to actually prepare memes, such as uh, extracting useful information and cleaning the text from the memes. Then we'll talk about how you use, uh, how we can create configurations to train a model using MATK. And then uh, thirdly, we'll run experiments, you know, to, uh, to select the right hyperparameters such as learning rate and dropout. <clears throat> and then lastly, we'll do some uh, model analysis. So first of all, we need to understand like the memes features. Uh, so it's uh, a bit repetitive, but uh, uh, hang or uh, hang with me for a while, right? So if you look at this, a uh, meme actually comprised of like you know text and image information. Uh, looking at this meme, we are able to know that you know first of all there's text overlay, and we need to be able to extract information like you know look at this sandwich maker club. Uh, I found on fish on clearance. Secondly, you know, it's important to understand that what are the different type of entities that's within this meme. So there's like a woman, there's a sandwich, making a sandwich, and there's also the kitchen, right? So indirectly, it's trying to say that woman belongs to the kitchen and, you know, they should be making sandwich for the men or, or for the guys, right? So it's a bit sexist. Uh, next, uh, we are able to, you know, extract information such as like, information such as like image caption. So what is this image describing? So a woman making sandwich in the kitchen. Next, you also can have like image features, right? So image features as in like, uh, on top of just detecting the web entities, I'll be able to get the different kind of features to represent the entity, right? So in this case, we are expecting something like three image features. And most importantly, it's about cleaning the meme, right? So as we know, uh, a lot of the visual language models, they are actually trained on uh, tasks such as like um, uh, image text grounding or text alignment. So basically, uh, given like a picture of a cat, uh, the caption will, uh, the matching text will be like, uh, this is a picture of a cat, right? So they are trying to do some alignment there. So having the text overlay on top of the meme can actually make, actually can create noise and confuse the model. So now the question will be like, you know, that sounds uh, easy enough, but how can I actually perform these kind of data reprocessing steps? So we actually have this thing called, uh, we actually have this uh, tool that we released. Uh, we call it the MATK uh, Meme Analytical Toolkit. So in this toolkit, we, uh, we, we predominantly have four steps. So there's the data set, meme pre-processing, uh, 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 basically uh, from the left to the right. So data set, then we'll do like meme pre-processing. We'll set up the configuration, and then this will lead to uh, the idea of training the model. And finally, we can do some model analysis. So MATK is meant to be a centralized GitHub repository that is meant to host, uh, not really host, but meant to prepare, uh, to provide like quick configuration for several memes data set and vision language model. 
So the, the idea of this is it helps with it helps with model reproducibility efforts. It conserves time and effort in adapting the code base meant for other purposes, right? So a lot of time when you get models that's online, they might not be meant for the meme detection task. They might be more for like visual questioning, visual question answering tasks, right? Uh, just an example. <laughs> okay. So the main building block for this MATK is actually PyTorch Lightning and Hydra. So Hydra, uh, PyTorch Lightning is basically a wrapper for PyTorch that helps with uh making you know the, the training of the model and the inference of the model more streamlined. And then Hydra is a configuration uh, uh file system, right? Allows you to you know break the different kind of uh break a uh, uh basically a huge application into like uh small components that's easily updatable and changeable. So first of all, let's take a look at uh meme pre-processing steps, right? So uh in the MATK uh repository, we have prepared examples. Uh it should be called tutorial. So uh, I'll I'll rename it. Okay. So the idea is uh, in this example, we have a uh, uh, we have a notebook to show you like, you know, what are the data pre-processing steps that you can actually take. So first of all, uh, we we have to say that, right? I mean, um, uh, a meme can combine, uh, consist of, you know, multiple elements, uh, as mentioned, like the four or the five things, text overlay, image caption, web entities, image features, meme cleaning. Okay. So to get started, first of all, in this tutorial, we'll be using the HUMP data set uh, from, uh, uh, from from another group, uh, LCS two group, right? So we'll be we'll looking at how to pre-process uh the data set uh for for our task. So first of all, uh, we'll install the requirements files, right? All the requirements that uh all the necessary packages, uh, and libraries that's needed for MATK. All right. So first of all, the first step that we should always take is extracting the uh the text overlay on on the meme. So to extract this text overlay, you will usually use some kind of OCR extraction, some optical character recognition. So uh, MATK features, uh, I mean, of course, um, you, you will be able to find, you know, open source and uh, libraries out there that, to perform OCR extraction. However, you know, some, uh, like I mentioned, it, this wrapper is meant to uh, accelerate your uh, adaptation and uh, 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 on uh, doing uh, memes prediction and memes detection. So right now we have a wrapper for easy OCR. So what we have to do is you simply can just uh like run this line, uh Python uh the file uh the easy OCR wrapper. And then subsequently you pass in the image directory and the output directory. Right. Once you do this, uh all the uh, co uh text coordinates and the text will be extracted and then output into a folder. Right. So I'll fix this out. So you know, once we done, one one we one once we are done with that. All the text overlay will be extracted and stored inside the output directory. So we can examine one of the example and see the accuracy of the OCR itself. So these are uh, visualization codes to actually examine how good the text extraction is. So in this case, we actually have this picture of Obama uh, and uh, there was like uh, uh, this piece of text which like a child on the other side of the border is no less worthy of love and compassion than my own child. Right? So these are benign meme and these are the text. Then we can see that you know by running easy OCR, we are able to get uh the text very clearly, and the model is actually able to determine the bounding box for the text very well. So now that we are done uh extracting the text, the next step that we need to do is you know how can we remove this text overlay from the meme so that you know the text uh the image and the text can be separated. So to do this, uh, we uh we also have the pre-processing folder that contains all the image in painting uh tools, right? So uh, likewise, you just need to run the Python, and then you just uh just run you need to run a Python script like the CV2 in painting wrapper, and in this case, you're passing the image directory, the output uh the output from the OCR from the previous step. Uh, where do you want to store the clean images, right? Because after after the uh after you do the in painting. There will be a clean image, right? And then lastly, is uh the mask directory is just for you to examine uh how good the masking is, right? Like what are the areas that is being in paint that is being in paint? Yeah. So if we take a look at uh the output here, we can see that uh once we once we are done running this, we can see for the same example, the model will the model determine that you know all the text area, right? The text coordinates are the area that needs to be in painted. 
And then we can see that the output of the uh, of the meme now, it, it looks like this, right? It's not perfect, but we can see that the text information is completely removed from the meme, right? So this will make the model more robust to, uh, in theory, it will make the more, uh, model more robust to like uh, text overlay, right? Because the, uh, there's, a, there's, a very high, there's a very good chance that the model will learn the position or, or the pixel information from this text overlay. So after this, uh, we will, with the clean image, we can proceed to the next two tasks. So firstly, is we can do image captioning. So for image captioning, there's a bunch of models uh, we have uh, implemented for Blip2, in short Blip, Clip, and m uh, Hour. So uh, in this case, in this tutorial, we'll use the Blip2 as a walkthrough example. So we'll install uh, the Salesforce levies. And then, but it's quite long. Uh, once we are done with uh, the installation of the Salesforce Levis uh, uh, library, likewise, once again, it's meant to be a wrapper. You, you call the wrapper uh, uh, script, put in what is the model type that you're running, the image directory, where do you want to get, where do you want to store the output? And then uh, these are extra parameters to do like parallel processing because it, it actually takes quite a while to run um, the bleep captioning. So once you're done with that, we can actually look at some of the image and the captions. So in this case, we are able to see that, you know, for this image, it says it's a close up of a person wearing a blue shirt. Right. So uh, looking at this, uh, we can actually see that, first of all, being a description is actually quite descriptive of what's going on. Right. It might not be able to identify uh, Barack Obama, but it's actually very accurate in saying that it's a person wearing a blue shirt. Right. So this is one of the challenges that actually uh, a lot of research is tackling, which is that the captions is not very descriptive enough of the image. Right. So the image actually comprises of uh, Barack Obama uh, in this image. Okay. So, uh, but generally it's still really good uh, for its capability. Then lastly, we can do the image feature extraction, which is, you know, we will extract the different kind of uh, 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 image features for the different uh, various region, right? So likewise, uh, I'd be repeating it, but yeah, likewise, you just, you just call a wrapper file. Then uh, you, you pass in what is the uh, faster RCNN. In, in this case, because we are extracting a uh, image feature, we are using uh, the faster RCNN to do the extraction. Sorry. So uh, you can uh, pass in the model that you want to use, pass in the image directory and the output feature directory. Right. And then we will see that all the features will be generated. And in this case, we likewise, uh, we will examine the structure and we can see that these are the information. Right. So the whole purpose of this uh, data pre-processing notebook is to show and demonstrate like uh, in MATK, we actually provide a lot of wrappers to help you, uh, you know, streamline the process from uh, pre-processing the meme to actually training a model. Right. So as you can see, the, to do OCR to do image imprinting, to do image captioning, to do image feature extraction is all very simple. You just you need to call a wrapper, pass in the image directory, and pass in the output directory, and uh, our package will handle it for you. So that's the first part. Okay, so the next part we'll be talking about, you know, how can we set up uh, the configurations? Like, so right now we have all the data uh, prepared. How can we actually train a model, right? So to do to train a model, we have to prepare a few things. So first of all, is we can have the configurations. Uh, we need to set up the configurations to tell the models where are the input files and uh, what is the model to use. So in this case, uh, we are training the Flava model on the Humpy data Humpy dataset. So firstly, what we will do is we need to configure the dataset. So the data set helps to you know itemize the pre-processed records as uh data set as records, uh you know aggregate all the primary uh, data set information, and aggregate the auxiliary information. So first of all, you have to uh create the data set class. So if you locate the data set folder uh in the repository, you can actually duplicate one of the existing data set files, right? Uh, this is in this is in the assumption that uh we are creating a new uh, uh, we are performing uh, training and inference on a new data set, right? So you duplicate one of the existing files and then you just need to ensure that the following information will still be provided after the pre-processing. So the, the, the mandatory information is like the image, the ID, right? The labels, of course, 
uh, the templated text and templated labels. Okay, so I'll go through in a sense what's templated text in a short moment. Okay, so first of all, when we do the, uh, this, this is a sample uh, that we provide. So the sample here is we will actually pre-process the data set first. So this step will actually, remove, will actually retrieve the image, the ID, and the labels. So once we have this, we will load the auxiliary information, and then we will format the input and output. So uh, uh, in, in this case, when we pre-process the information, like I mentioned, we will have the ID, the image, uh, sorry, we will have the image, we have the ID, and then after that, we have all the labels here. Right? Then subsequently, uh, we will we'll format the input. So in this case, the input is because um, when you have auxiliary information like the image caption or the web entities, right? Uh, often and not what you have to do is you actually have to combine uh, the the over the text overlay with all this information, right? So in this piece of code, it, uh, uh, generally what it does is that you provide some kind of template, right? The template will say something like uh, the template. We will say uh, it consists of the text, the overlay text. It will contain the caption. It will contain the web, web entities, right? And then the uh, this piece of code will actually help you uh, format it accordingly, right? So we are trying to offload uh, all the like you know the coding process. Uh, we are trying to make it as simple as possible for our participants, uh, for our users to actually uh, use the MATK uh, easily. So after that, we just have to uh, create a new uh, Humpy configuration. So in this, uh, conf so previously what we had is a Python file. They will do the pre-processing for you. However, this Python file doesn't know where your data set resides, doesn't know where's your image, doesn't know what's the auxiliary information. So what, what, what you need to do is you just need to add in a configuration file to tell the model where is the annotation, what is the, where is the image directory, and what are the auxiliary, inform auxiliary information. So in this case, we tell we tell the model, uh, we tell the we tell MATK, right? Sorry, MATK that um the these are the train, validate, test, and prediction files for annotation for the annotation. Likewise for the image directory, and likewise for the auxiliary dictionary, right? So it's important. Uh, the dictionary wise, you have to explicitly mention, uh, what are these auxiliary information? So in this case, the auxiliary information is caption. Okay, so that is all you have to do on the data side. And once we have this, the data set, the data set will be prepared and the data loader will be ready, right? So the next thing we will do is we have to create a Flava model. So um, in this case, the model class will actually need to inherit the base lightning module and it needs to contain the following functionality, the training step, the validation step, test step and prediction step. However, like, uh, no, not to overload uh, uh, the, the participants and the audience, right? Uh, what what uh, what we'll be going through is we'll be going through a model that has that has already been implemented uh, within the MATK package by default, right? So what we have to do is we simply have to reference the model class in the model configuration. So the configuration is as easy as class path, a uh, model dot flava flava classification model, right? What is the model class that we are using, which is a uh, flava full? And then we can just configure like the dropout and the optimizer. Okay. So we are done with like the data. Sorry. We are done with the data set and then we are done with the models. So now we actually have to do like a composition, right? So we have to tell the mod, we have to we have to create a file to say that this is the model that I want to use and this is the data set I want to use. So we will create an experiment configuration that will tell the model, like, you know, default, I'm going to use the model, blah, blah. I'm going to use the data set, Humpy. I'm going to use a data module called processor data module, right? It is a uh, processor for the data set itself. Uh, right, the trainer, we uh, you can use the default one, which is a single GPU trainer. And then you just tell me what's, tell, uh, tell the model, uh, tell the experiment, uh, uh, inform like the training pipeline, what are the matrix that you want to use? So in this case, it's accuracy and AURC, right? Then subsequently, you can override all the subjective or optional uh, parameters. So in this case, you have to tell it like this is we are going to use the add-on optimizer, right? Uh, the data set class, right? And this is the text template. So in this text template, if you are interested to use the caption, what you will do is you will like copy this as this element, and then you'll put in uh, and replace it with caption, right? Then in this case, your input to the model will be both the text and the caption. 
And once you are done, uh, uh, you are basically set to train the model itself. So to train the model, you call the main file uh, in, the, in the package. And then you just need to specify that the experiment will be the Humpy Flava, which is Humpy is the data set. So Humpy Flava model, right? And then you just say that you want to fit the model. And what is the trainer? So the trainer in this case is the single GPU trainer. Uh, yeah. And then uh similarly the model will uh similarly the package will actually train the uh will will create will construct initiate uh <laughs> the model and then load the data set so that it will start training the model right so as you can see this is the past training results uh we are not doing it live because the training will take some time right uh so at the end of the day we can see that the train model can actually perform up to maybe uh up to around like 81 percent accuracy on the uh, Humpy data set, and also uh, 86.63 AUROC on the Humpy data set. And then lastly, is we also can do the inference uh, using uh, the package by specifying the module uh, model checkpoint. Yep. So this is, uh, so as you can see, like the amount of code block that I went through to train Flava model on a Humpy data set is probably about probably within 10 code blocks, right? So you just need to run like 10 commands uh, or do 10 edits, uh, then you'll be able to actually uh do the entire pipeline from the data pre-processing, uh, from the data processing pipeline all the way to the model training pipeline, right? Okay, so once we are done with the uh this aspect, uh, one, once we are done with all the training and everything, we will be able to retain the train model checkpoints, and we will be able to see the experimental logs. Uh, and after, now that we are done with like the entire training and the inference, I think an important aspect is how can we better understand uh, the decision behind the model classification, right? So it is often, you know, people, we will often stop at something like, oh, the performance is good and we're done. Or uh, the performance is bad and this doesn't work. But are we able to, you know, go one step further and to better analyze and understand uh, why is this model trying, uh, why is this model, uh, how is this model working, right? Why is it getting it wrong or why is it getting it correct? So MATK actually also provide model ana analysis tools that actually help to derive, uh, derive uh, insights into the model performance through like perturbation based techniques and gradient based techniques, right? So for example, we have the integrated gradient on encoder decoder model. So as you can see, like, you know, by, by hovering over like the Muslim token, the MUS token, we can see what are the importance uh, word that contribute to this token being predicted. And likewise, we can do the line analysis on vision and which model to understand like, you know, what, what are the, what are the important region or area or pixels right that the model is actually looking at so in this case we can see like this uh this probably uh this guy with uh uh is being uh emphasized on and also the guy holding the gun like the rifle part is being emphasized yeah so just to go through one of the techniques which is like the lamb analysis right so the lamb analysis is actually like it constructs surrogate linear re, uh, regression model to actually approximate the prediction. So what it actually does is it just generate like random data perturbation, right? And it use it as the training set instead. And then what you will do is you, you try, you, as the data perturbation uh, uh, changes, right? You will see what are the perturbation that makes the model uh, predict correct, like hateful, and what are the perturbation that makes the model predict non-hateful, right? So this will give you like a rough understanding and explanation on the model decision. So right now we are in the MATK like package, we actually support like five data sets. So we support the FHM uh, Facebook hateful memes data set. Uh, the second version of the data set which is the Facebook fine grained hateful memes data set. Uh, Multimedia automatic misogyny identification, MEMI. Uh, the harmful meme data set, also the hum, like, sort of known as the HUMC as well. And the harmful meme uh, politics data set, HUMP, which is what we went through in the tutorial. So for the models that we support, we support uh, uh, several. So uh, right now we support text-based model. We support T5, Clem T5, BART, Roboto, and PropHead. And then for visual language model, we support VisualBerg, LX, Merck, and uh, Flava. 
So for future development, we are looking at doing a PFT integration. Uh, like, you know, right now, language, large language model has been like the topic that's ongoing. And we can see that large language model are actually outperforming uh, a lot of the, uh, outperforming a lot of the baseline constructor over the past years, right? So we're looking at, you know, PFT fine tuning uh, for Llama 3 and like Lava 1.6. And then we're looking at, you know, more data set support. So recently just attended the multi-model content analysis for social good, right? So they actually, they actually has a paper on, you know, the RUH, RUH, MM, RUH stands for Russia, Ukraine, hate. Okay. And then maybe like total defense meme, which is a Singapore based uh, data set. So, yeah. So of course, uh, we would like to hear feedback on like, you know, what would be the most exciting features that you would like to see in, uh, uh, to be developed further in this package and like do you have any comments on how we can improve uh, our current library like what are the improvements you would like to see okay, okay so no worries. so uh, we probably can bring this offline uh, later yeah okay so now i'll pass it back to roy uh to talk about you know the gaps and the opportunities uh in this space Hey, thanks everyone uh, for staying all the way to the end. So I'm quickly go through, um, you know, what's the gaps and going forward on this. This one's not working yet. Okay, so uh, I think throughout the talks, um, Ray and Mishan actually highlighted some of the potential problems that you'll face uh, when working on this problem on memes detection and memes understanding. So I'm just going to like summarize everything into the kind of major challenges and limitations. And of course, this forms up the research sort of directions if you're interested in this space. Some of the questions that uh, remains unanswered uh, that we can actually work on. Okay, so um, you know, feel free to chip in if you have any other questions uh, in this space or, or limitations that you want to discuss. I think one of the things that uh, we need to deal with is com complex abstraction. So. Um, how do we extract you know enough information from uh memes? It's one of the things that uh, we face challenge about, right? So, uh, even with the large language models or large multi models, uh, we might not be able to extract you know uh, complex meanings or abstractions from from the memes itself. You know, how do we uh, look at that? You know, uh, extracting out sarcasm, uh, meta metaphorical contents and all or implicit content. So this is this is a very difficult problem. Um, the second point is, of course, we have really briefly touched on, which is the subjectivity in annotation. So because hate speech or, or the kind of contents that we are dealing with, particularly for dark memes, right? Uh, uh, careful contents and or toxic contents. So there is certain subjectivity, there's certain bias that's being introduced uh, into the annotations as well. And we sort of see this even at the most widely used data sets, like, um, like what are being introduced by the two of them uh, from, from the... Facebook memes, uh, hateful meme challenge to what is currently widely used out there, like the Humpy data set and all. Uh, there remains certain subjectivity in the annotations itself. Although the nice thing, as I mentioned just now during the Q&A, that uh, many of these data set, besides giving the overall labels, they also you know, publish to say that, okay, um, this particular meme, uh, there's three annotators. Annotators A says what, annotators B says what and whatnot. You can actually analyze uh, this part, okay? Uh, that's it. Uh, this remains a problem. Okay. Um, why? Uh, if you want to have high quality data, then you need to control the annotation. Then what will happen is that the, the data set that can actually annotate, right, is usually very small. If you want to scale this up to tens of thousands of memes, then you'll be using things like Amazon Turks, all these kind of cloud source platforms, right? If you're using a cloud sourcing platforms, then there is a problem, right? Cloud source workers only agree 23% of the time. Most of the time they'll disagree. Why? Because they are low paid workers. They will want to get this thing done fast. So they may not be that accurate in terms of the annotation. This is the problem that we face in annotation. Okay. Uh, there is inadequate solutions. So even though I think Ray and, and Ming-Chan actually highlighted uh, the number of like solutions that's out there, uh, there is still quite a fair bit of um, questions that's been unanswered in Mim's understanding. So we are only showing the tip of the iceberg. We are only looking at, um, you know, hateful memes detection. Uh, but, you know, there are many other tasks that we have not explored. For example, 
uh, that our team actually look at also, like things like uh, memes clustering. How do you cluster memes? So should you use a image clustering technique or should you be using a text clustering techniques or hybrid or multi-model clustering techniques? How do we do that? Are we able to extract out topics, do topic modelings from memes? Uh, how do you generate, uh, you know, use unsupervised approach on memes? This will be one uh, solution that's lagging severely. Then there is, of course, the generative part, generating memes. There's also another big issue that, that, we, are, that uh, we are facing in this, right? So, and of course, within the classification part, um, there is still a lag in this because um, the, the multi-models right now are still improving, right? So, so there is a lot to be done in this space, okay? Um, one of the issues that uh, if you pay attention to, to, the, to the front part of the tutorial, you realize that many of the techniques that we have discussed, even those that we have included in MATK, are supervised techniques. And they require a lot of training data, right? Uh, in I think if you if you were around for yesterday's uh, OTS uh, day, um, there is this particular challenge that is being launched to to look at zero shot uh hateful memes challenge, right? So this is a more realistic uh setting where you don't really have the training data, but how do you do the detection? So this is something that that we want to look at. How do we um, elevate or remove this over dependence on data processing or, or, or supervised data. So this is one thing that we are also looking at, you know, how do we remove this part? And of course, uh, one of the issues that we also face is about generalization. So bulk of the memes that has been created out there, right, are English memes. Can that be applied to the Chinese memes or memes from the other language or data culture? These are also things that we also need to look at, right? Or unseen memes. For example, there is a new event that's going on and then how do we generalize to this new event so this is another thing that we are we are also looking at okay so uh the last part about old fitting has always been there for many of the machine learning tasks so this task on classification of memes is no surprise it will also be there right um yeah so one of the most promising things that we are seeing right now is of course the large multi-models models which i think uh, we have checked quite a fair bit about um, but there is issues with it. One of the major issues is, of course, hallucination. So hallucination is not just as this in our tasks, right? Many of the multi-model tasks, you face this particular problem. But uh, you also face the same problem if you're running this for MIMS analysis, okay? And of course, many of these models, they have a lack of uh, inherent knowledge or cultural context uh, and is inaccurate in terms of performing that detection itself. Uh, and I actually can show some examples in, 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 the, in the next few slides or so, okay? So this is an example. So um, there is parts, the parts that has been highlighted in red, actually parts that has been hallucinated. So for example, this is the meme uh, that's been shown. Let's see. Yeah, so this is the meme. You realize that uh, in here, right? It has this, uh, uh, like for example, mini GPT-4. Uh, it says what? Um, the image of a woman sitting in front of a desk with a laptop. So, so obviously, if it's this image, it, this will never be a laptop, right? Because it's from World War II. Right, so um, that there is a lot, like you know, uh, the image is uh, still from uh, from a movie or a TV show, which is again not true. So there is a lot of like hallucination that's going on uh, in in this kind of models on this. Okay, um, uh, same thing, inconsistent uh, model inference. So if you look at this, this is also something that we are getting. So GPT four and mini GPT uh, four, uh, it has the correct decision, correct reasoning. But the uh, mini GPT uh, version two, right? It has incorrect decisions on this. So you see, uh, where is it? Yeah, here, right? So this is uh, this is the part, right? So if you compare a result, if you compare this uh, across the different models, it might give you different reasoning on this. There's an inconsistency in terms of the explanation itself. So this is again very common uh, if you are using and leveraging on these large language models or large multi-models models. Okay. Um. Like many of the machine learning problems, data handling, data uh, processing is one of the issues that we face. So um, I think one part you guys probably don't realize a main challenge that we face is this one, OCR. So OCR, right, if it's perfect, if it's English, there's no problem. But if you check out the, the yesterday, the, the OTS challenge, we actually give memes in Tamil in other languages that OCR did not work so well because um, maybe the OCR techniques existing, right, may not work so well in many of these low resource languages. So that becomes a problem. So if you're extracting this, then this becomes an issue. 
And if you are getting real world memes, real world memes, right? The text will comes in all sorts of forms. I mean, uh, all sorts of fonts and like shapes and sizes, right? So that becomes a problem as well. So how do we how do we extract that? So this remains a major challenge in uh, uh, memes understanding. Um, if you are doing classification for hateful memes, class remains unbalanced because most of the memes out there will be okay, right? So you you'll get very few hateful memes in the real world. Uh, that's one of the issues that we face as well. Uh, high, di high dimensionality and computational demand. Again, this exists in many of the multimodal tasks. Uh, this means understanding is no difference. This is also one issue that we face. Um, the last one is actually the, the one that we have discussed quite a fair bit throughout the Q&A, which is the bias and of course the over-representation uh, in, the, in the meme space, right? So um, there is a, this, is a, this is a data set uh, uh, that, uh, that they actually analyze. So if you realize, um, let's say if you look at harmful and versus not harmful, right? If the topic is actually on Joe Biden, then good chance the memes is actually going to be harmful than non-harmful, right? Uh, if it's going to be on Democratic Party, good chance it's going to be harmful than non-harmful. Basically, you know, there's a lot of hate towards it, right? Uh, and if it's about Mexican, uh, then there is a more chance of it being non non uh, hateful or non-harmful in a way. So it's because of the way it's being collected uh, and the way it's being structured it has an inherent bias towards a certain community. So this is something that we have to watch out for in the model itself as well, okay? But it does reflect what the real world is also as well, okay? Okay, um, this is also another uh, interesting point that we brought back uh, about the uh, evolution of content. So for example, there is a new event that's unfolding and then there'll be new memes that's being created. How do we cater for this kind of new content? So usually we'll, system will struggle with this, right? How do we do with generalization to new content, uh, especially in this kind of like uh, memes that's being widely shared on social media. Uh, one of the things that, you know, uh, that people have explored and it work quite well right now is this thing called the FSL, basically few short learning. So as you do few short learning, right? Okay, the performance actually gets better on this. So this is a very promising direction uh, that even I think, uh, I think this was taken from I think this is taken from yeah, Meta. So Meta is the one that is trying this. So Meta, a uh, few short uh, learners, is able to basically adapt quite well to, to the new class of like memes that's coming in. Okay, you can actually check out the work uh, from, uh, we'll share out the slides. You can actually check out this. Uh, harmful content evolved quickly. Uh, the new AI system is able to tackle this from Facebook. Okay, and the way they actually tackle this is to use this thing called the multi-model few short learning approach. So you don't have a lot of training data. It's actually trying to do few short learning and then getting it to basically adapt it well and generalize it to the new content. So this is what it's actually trying to do in this space. Okay. That remains a direction to basically look at. Um, contextualization, again, we have been stressing this quite a fair bit already. Many of the memes we are looking at right now, or we have shown case are very English based, very Western based. But, uh, you know, they are not the only groups that's using memes. If you pay attention to Chinese memes, uh, it's very different from how, I mean, the Chinese community uses memes uh, in a different context, in a different style from how the English folks or the Western folks actually use it, right? So uh, that remains a, a, a large element on the cultural aspect that has not been really studied. So this is one thing that we can actually look at as well. It remains a gap to fill. Um, Platform restriction actually comes from a point, from a different standpoint, which is um, if the goal was to sort of stop people from sharing harmful content or, or hateful memes, right? Um, one of the thoughts was that, uh, are we able to identify the source, identify the target? Now, because the platform restriction, it may not allow this, right? Because uh, it, it provides certain, uh, uh, and you know, uh, um, uh, people can actually remain uh, anonymous, uh, in, in this kind of like uh, platforms. So they might be able to share content or harmful content easier and untraceable in this, right? So um, th this has been this has been looked at like, for example, right? Um, on platforms that are less regulated, for example, like this one, uh, like Get, if you're familiar with this, or uh, 4chan, right? They are less regulated, right? Is there a higher chance of you finding harmful content or hate hateful memes from it versus the more regulated ones like Facebook and, and, and Reddit? Some of you ask, right, like, you know, how do we get all this kind of harmful content? It's because we are looking at it from all the less regulated field. Okay, so if you if you dig into the less regulated space, you'll be able to find all this kind of harmful content uh, easier. 
okay, compared to compared to the more regulated platforms. Um, yeah, so this is the point that I was trying to get at, which is, um, are we able to identify the real instigator of the harm, right? So if everybody is actually behind, uh, you know, the anonymous code, right? So are we able to identify it? It's really hard, right? Uh, but if we are able to do this, uh, you know, uh, trying to under understand the user intent better, uh, you might be able to drive at, you know, understanding who are the folks who are actually sharing the memes or creating the memes. So this remains a largely unstudied area, okay? So we've been looking at, you know, detecting the memes, understanding the memes itself, but we have not really understand, right? Who are the people who are creating it? Who are the people who are sharing it? So this is one area that, that technically we can actually look at better, okay? Right, so this slides actually try to sum up all the kind of things that uh, we would consider, you know, going forward in terms of memes understanding we can do. Um, and of course, we have been talking about this for quite some time, right? So throughout the talk, we have covered parts and parcel of this thing. Uh, I will not go into too much details on this. Uh, if you are interested uh, into any of these topics more, you know, uh, feel free to reach out to our team. We can actually talk more about it. Yeah, on this. Yeah, so I think with this, uh, it brings me to the end of our tutorial. I think we are early. Uh, but if you have any questions, uh, we're happy to take Q&A and discussion on this. Yeah, so because it's a very small group, I, I know that uh, this is probably a group that's less interested in the LM part. But uh, we'll be happy to, to engage and talk more since it's a small group. Yeah, uh, with this, I think we've come to the end of the tutorial. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Yeah. Does it end the record? Oh, okay. Yeah. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Um, ask this to Chrissy. <laughs>